Frankenstein by Mary Shelley. To Mrs. Savile, England, St. Petersburg, December the 11th. You will rejoice to hear that no disaster has accompanied the commencement of an enterprise which you have regarded with such evil forebodings. I arrived here yesterday, and my first task is to assure my dear sister of my welfare and increasing confidence in the success of my undertaking. I am already far north of London, and I feel a cold northern breeze play upon my cheeks. This breeze, which has travelled from the regions towards which I am advancing, gives me a foretaste of those icy climes. There, Margaret, the sun is forever visible, its broad disk just skirting the horizon and diffusing a perpetual splendour, what may not be expected in a country of eternal light. This expedition has been the favourite dream of my early years, I have read with ardour the accounts of the various voyages which have been made in the prospect of arriving at the North Pacific Ocean through the seas which surround the Pole. My education was neglected, yet these volumes were my study day and night. Six years have passed since I resolved on my present undertaking. I can even now remember the hour from which I dedicated myself to this great enterprise. I commenced by inuring my body to hardship. I voluntarily endured cold, famine, thirst, and want of sleep. And now, Margaret, do I not deserve to accomplish some great purpose? This is the most favourable period for travelling in Russia. They fly quickly over the snow in their sledges. The cold is not excessive if you are wrapped in furs, a dress which I have already adopted. I shall depart for Archangel in a fortnight or three weeks, and my intention is to hire a ship there, I do not intend to sail until the month of June, and when shall I return? Ah, dear sister, how can I answer this? If I succeed, many, many months, perhaps years, will pass before you and I may meet. If I fail, you will see me again soon, or never. Farewell, my dear, excellent Margaret. Heaven shower down blessings on you, and save me, that I may again and again testify my gratitude for all your love and kindness. Your affectionate brother, R. Walton. To Mrs. Savile, England. Archangel, 28th March. How slowly the time passes here, encompassed as I am by frost and snow. Yet a second step is taken towards my enterprise. I have hired a vessel and am occupied in collecting my sailors. But I have one want, which I have never yet been able to satisfy, and the absence of the object of which I now feel is a most severe evil. I have no friend, Margaret. I desire the company of a man who could sympathise with me. I have no one near me, gentle yet courageous, possessed of a cultivated as well as of a capacious mind, whose tastes are like my own, to approve or amend my plans. But this is a useless complaint. I shall certainly find no friend on the wide ocean, nor even here in Archangel among merchants and seamen. Yet some feelings beat even in these rugged bosoms. I cannot describe to you my sensations on the near prospect of my undertaking. I am going to unexplored regions, to the land of mist and snow. But I shall kill no albatross, therefore do not be alarmed for my safety, or if I should come back to you as worn and woeful as the ancient mariner. Shall I meet you again? after having traversed immense seas. I cannot expect success, yet I cannot bear to look on the reverse of the picture. Continue for the present to write to me by every opportunity. I may receive your letters on some occasions when I need them most to support my spirits. Remember me with affection, should you never hear from me again. Your affectionate brother, Robert Walton. To Mrs. Savile, England. July 7th. My dear sister, I write a few lines in haste to say that I am safe and well advanced on my voyage. This letter will reach England by a merchantman now on its homeward voyage from Archangel. Although I may not see my native land for many years, I am in good spirits. We have already reached a very high latitude, but it is the height of summer, 
and although not so warm as in England, the southern gales, which blow us speedily towards those shores which I so ardently desire to attain, breathe a degree of renovating warmth which I had not expected. Adieu, my dear Margaret. Be assured that for my sake, as well as yours, I will not rashly encounter danger. But success shall crown my endeavours. Wherefore not? What can stop the determined heart and resolved will of man? My swelling heart involuntarily pours itself out thus, but I must finish. Heaven bless my beloved sister, R.W. To Mrs. Savile, England, August 5th. So strange an accident has happened to us that I cannot forbear recording it, although it is very probable that you will see me before these papers can come into your possession. Last Monday, July 31st, we were nearly surrounded by ice. Our situation was somewhat dangerous, especially as we were compassed round by a very thick fog. We accordingly lay to. About two o'clock the mist cleared away, and we beheld, stretched out in every direction, vast and irregular plains of ice, which seemed to have no end. Some of my comrades groaned, and my own mind began to grow watchful with anxious thoughts, when a strange sight suddenly attracted our attention. We perceived a low carriage, fixed on a sledge and drawn by dogs, pass on towards the north, at the distance of half a mile. A being, which had the shape of a man, but apparently of gigantic stature, sat in the sledge and guided the dogs. We watched with our telescopes until the traveller was lost to us. The appearance excited our unqualified wonder. We were, as we believed, many hundred miles from any land, but this apparition seemed to denote that it was not, in reality, so distant as we supposed. Shut in by ice, however, it was impossible to follow his track. About two hours after this, we heard the ground sea, and before the night we were free. We, however, lay to until the morning, fearing to encounter in the dark those large, loose masses which float about after the breaking up of the ice. In the morning, however, as soon as it was light, I went upon the deck and found all the sailors busy on one side of the vessel, apparently talking to someone in the sea. It was, in fact, a sledge which had drifted towards us in the night on a large fragment of ice. Only one dog remained alive, but there was a human being within it, whom the sailors were persuading to enter the vessel. He was not, as the other traveller appeared to be, a savage inhabitant of some undiscovered island, but a European. On perceiving me, the stranger addressed me in English, although with a foreign accent. "'Before I come on board your vessel,' said he, "'will you have the kindness to inform me whither you are bound?' "'You may conceive my astonishment on hearing such a question addressed to me from a man on the brink of destruction.' I replied, however, that we were on a voyage of discovery towards the northern pole. Upon hearing this, he appeared satisfied and consented to come on board. I never saw a man in so wretched a condition. We attempted to carry him into the cabin, but as soon as he had quitted the fresh air, he fainted. We accordingly restored him suitably, and as soon as he showed signs of life, we wrapped him in blankets, and by slow degrees he recovered and ate a little soup which restored him wonderfully. Two days passed in this manner before he was able to speak. When he had in some measure recovered, I removed him to my own cabin. I never saw a more interesting creature. His eyes have generally an expression of wildness, but there are moments when, if anyone performs an act of kindness to him, his whole countenance is lighted up, but he is generally melancholy and despairing. When my guest was a little recovered, I had great trouble to keep off the men who wished to ask him a thousand questions. Once, however, the lieutenant asked why he had come so far on so strange a vehicle. His countenance instantly assumed an aspect of the deepest gloom. To seek one who fled from me. And did the man whom you pursue travel in the same fashion? Yes. Then I fancy we have seen him. For the day before we picked you up, we saw some dogs drawing a sledge with a man in it across the ice. This aroused the stranger's attention, and he asked a multitude of questions. When alone with me, he inquired if I thought that the breaking up of the ice had destroyed the other sledge. 
I replied that I could not answer with any degree of certainty. From this time, a new spirit of life animated the decaying frame of the stranger. He manifests the greatest eagerness to be on deck, to look for the sledge which had before appeared. But he is too weak, and I have promised that someone should watch for him. Such is my journal of what relates to this strange occurrence up to the present day. The stranger has gradually improved in health, but is very silent. For my own part, I begin to love him as a brother. He must have been a noble creature in his better days. I said in one of my letters, my dear Margaret, that I should find no friend on the wide ocean. Yet I have found a man who, before his spirit had been broken by misery, I should have been happy to have possessed as a brother of the heart. I shall continue my journal, should I have any fresh incidents to record. August 13th. My affection for my guest increases every day. He is now much recovered from his illness and is continually on the deck, yet although unhappy, he is not so utterly occupied by his own misery, but that he interests himself deeply in the projects of others. He has frequently conversed with me on mine, which I have communicated to him without disguise. I was easily led by the sympathy which he evinced to use the language of my heart, and to say with all the fervour that warmed me how gladly I would sacrifice my fortune, my existence, my every hope to the furtherance of my enterprise. One man's life or death were but a small price to pay for the acquirement of the knowledge which I sought, for the dominion I should acquire and transmit over the elemental foes of our race. At first I perceived that he tried to suppress his emotion. He placed his hands before his eyes, and tears began to trickle fast from between his fingers, but at length he spoke in broken accents. Unhappy man, do you share my madness? Have you drunk also of the intoxicating draught? Hear me, let me reveal my tale, and you will dash the cup from your lips. Such words, you may imagine, strongly excited my curiosity, but the paroxysm of grief that had seized the stranger overcame his weakened powers, and many hours of repose and tranquil conversation were necessary to restore his composure. Having conquered the violence of his feelings, he then led me again to converse, and asked me particularly the history of my earlier years. The tale was quickly told, so I further spoke of my desire of finding a friend, and expressed my conviction that a man could boast of little happiness who did not enjoy this blessing. I agree with you, replied the stranger. We are unfashioned creatures, but half made up if one dearer than ourselves do not lend his aid to perfectionate our weak and faulty natures. You have hope and the world before you, and have no cause for despair. I once had a friend, the most noble of human creatures, but I have now lost everything, and cannot begin life anew. And at this his countenance became expressive of a calm, settled grief, and presently he retired to his cabin. Will you smile at the enthusiasm I express concerning this divine wanderer? Sometimes I have endeavoured to discover what quality it is which he possesses that elevates him so immeasurably above any other person I ever knew. I believe it is an intuitive discernment, a quick but never-failing power of judgment, a penetration into the causes of things, unequalled for clearness and precision. Add to this a facility of expression and a voice whose varied intonations are soul-subduing music. August 19th. Yesterday the stranger said to me, You may easily perceive, Captain Walton, that I have suffered great and unparalleled misfortunes. I had determined at one time that the memory of these evils should die with me, but you have won me to alter my determination. Prepare to hear of occurrences which are usually deemed marvellous. Were we among the tamer scenes of nature, I might fear to encounter your unbelief, but many things will appear possible in these wild and mysterious regions which would provoke the laughter of those unacquainted with the ever-varied powers of nature. I wait for but one event, and then I shall repose in peace. I understand your feeling— continued he, perceiving that I wished to interrupt him, but you are mistaken. 
Nothing can alter my destiny. Listen to my history, and you will perceive how irrevocably it is determined. I have resolved every night to record, as nearly as possible in his own words, what he has related during the day. This manuscript will doubtless afford you the greatest pleasure, but to me, who know him and who hear it from his own lips, with what interest and sympathy shall I read it in some future day? Even now, as I commence my task, his full-toned voice swells in my ears. Strange and harrowing must be his story, frightful the storm which embraced the gallant vessel on its course and wrecked it thus. I am, by birth, a Genovese, and my family is one of the most distinguished of that republic. My father was respected by all who knew him, and he passed his younger days perpetually occupied by the affairs of his country. It was not until the decline of life that he became a husband and father of a family. As the circumstances of his marriage illustrate his character, I cannot refrain from relating them. One of his most intimate friends was a merchant, who had fallen into poverty. This man, whose name was Beaufort, could not bear to live in poverty and oblivion in the same country where he had formerly been distinguished. Having paid his debts, therefore, he retreated with his daughter to Lucerne, where he lived unknown and in wretchedness. My father loved Beaufort, and as the merchant had taken effectual measures to conceal himself, it took my father ten months before he discovered his abode. But when he entered the house, misery and despair alone welcomed him. Through reflection on his position, grief had taken hold of Beaufort's mind, and at the end of three months he had lain on a bed of sickness. His daughter attended him with great tenderness, but she saw with despair that their little fund was rapidly decreasing. However, Caroline Beaufort possessed a mind of an uncommon mould, and her courage rose to support her. She procured plain work, she plaited straw, and contrived to earn a pittance to support life. Despite this, her father grew gradually worse, and in the tenth month died, leaving her an orphan and a beggar. This last blow overcame her, and she was kneeling by Beaufort's coffin, weeping bitterly, when my father entered the chamber. He came like a protecting spirit, and, conducting her to Geneva, placed her under the protection of a relation. Two years after this event, Caroline became his wife. There was a considerable difference between the ages of my parents, but this circumstance seemed to unite them only closer. During the two years that had elapsed previous to their marriage, my father had gradually relinquished all his public functions, and immediately after their union they sought the pleasant climate of Italy and a tour through that land of wonders as a restorative for her weakened frame. From Italy they visited Germany and France. I, their eldest child, was born at Naples, and as an infant accompanied them. I remained for several years their only child, and, much as they were attached to each other, they seemed to draw inexhaustible stores of affection from a very mine of love to bestow them on me. I was their plaything and their idol and something better, their child, the innocent and helpless creature bestowed on them by heaven. For a long time I was their only care. My mother had much desired to have a daughter, but I continued their single offspring. When I was about five years old, however, they passed a week on the shores of Lake Como. During one of their walks a poor cot attracted their notice, and one day, when my father had gone by himself to Milan, my mother, accompanied by me, visited this abode. Here she found a peasant and his wife distributing a scanty meal to five hungry babies. Among these there was one which attracted my mother far above all the rest. She appeared of a different stock. This child was very thin and very fair. Her hair was the brightest living gold, her blue eyes cloudless, 
and her lips and the moulding of her face so expressive of sensibility and sweetness that none could behold her without looking on her as of a distinct species and bearing a celestial stamp in all her features. The peasant woman eagerly communicated her history. She was not her child, but the daughter of a Milanese nobleman. Her mother was a German and had died on giving her birth. The infant had been placed with these good people to nurse, but the father never returned. He exerted himself to obtain the liberty of his country as he saw it, but as a consequence his property was confiscated and his child became an orphan and beggar. The child remained with her foster parents. When my father returned from Milan, he found playing with me in the hall of our villa a creature who seemed to shed radiance from her looks and whose form and motions were lighter than the chamois of the hills. My parents happily took the child to their hearts, and Elizabeth Lavenza became the inmate of my parents' house, my more than sister. On the evening previous to her being brought to my home, my mother had said playfully, I have a pretty present for you, Victor. Tomorrow you shall have it. And when she presented Elizabeth to me, I, with childish seriousness, interpreted her words literally and looked upon Elizabeth as mine, mine to protect, love, and cherish. We were brought up together. There was not quite a year difference in our ages. Harmony was the soul of our companionship, and the diversity and contrast that subsisted in our characters drew us nearer together. Elizabeth busied herself with following the aerial creations of the poets and in the magnificent appearances of things. I delighted in investigating their causes, for the world was to me a secret which I desired to divine. On the birth of a second son, William, my junior by seven years, my parents gave up entirely their wandering life. We possessed a house in Geneva and a compagne on Belle-Rive, the eastern shore of the lake. We resided principally in the latter, and the lives of my parents were passed in considerable seclusion. I was indifferent to my schoolfellows in general, but I united myself in the bonds of the closest friendship to one of them. Henry Clerval was the son of a merchant of Geneva, a boy of singular talent and fancy. He loved enterprise, hardship, and even danger for its own sake, and he became my friend. No human being could have passed a happier childhood than myself. My parents were possessed by the very spirit of kindness and indulgence. We felt that they were not tyrants to rule our lot according to their caprice, but the agents and creators of all the many delights which we enjoyed. My temper was sometimes violent, and my passions vehement, but by some law in my temperature they were turned not towards childish pursuits, but to an eager desire to learn. And it was not a desire to learn all things indiscriminately, it was the secrets of heaven and earth that I desired to learn. I might have become sullen in my study, but that Elizabeth was there to subdue me to a semblance of her own gentleness. And Clerval, too, might not have been so perfectly humane had not she enfolded to him the real loveliness of beneficence and made doing good the end and aim of his soaring ambition. I feel exquisite pleasure in dwelling on the recollections of childhood, before misfortune had tainted my mind. Besides, in drawing the picture of my early days, I also record those events which led, by insensible steps, to my after-tale of misery. Natural philosophy is the genius that has regulated my fate. I desire, therefore, in this narration, to state those facts which led to my predilection for that science. When I was thirteen years of age, we all went on a party of pleasure to the baths near Tonon, the inclemency of the weather obliged us to remain a day confined to the inn. In this house I chanced to find a volume of the works of Cornelius Agrippa, and reading it a new light seemed to dawn upon my mind, and, bounding with joy, I communicated my discovery to my father. My father looked carelessly at the title page of the book and said, Ah, Cornelius Agrippa, my dear Victor, do not waste your time upon this. It is sad trash. If... Instead of this remark, 
My father had taken the pains to explain to me that the principles of Agrippa had been entirely exploded, and that a modern system of science had been introduced which possessed much greater powers than the ancient, I should certainly have thrown Agrippa aside. But the cursory glance had by no means convinced me that my father was acquainted with the volume's contents, and I continued to read. When I returned home, my first care was to procure the whole works of this author, and afterwards of Paracelsus and Albertus Magnus. I read and studied the wild fancies of these writers with delight. They appeared to me treasures known to few besides myself. I took their word for all that they averred, and became their disciple. Under the guidance of my new preceptors, I entered with the greatest diligence into the search of the elixir of life. What glory would attend the discovery if I could banish disease from the human frame, and render man invulnerable to any but a violent death? When I was about fifteen years old, we had retired to our house near Belrive, when we witnessed a most violent and terrible thunderstorm. I remained, while the storm lasted, watching its progress with curiosity. As I stood at the door, I beheld a stream of fire issue from an old and beautiful oak, which stood about twenty yards from our house, and so soon as the dazzling light vanished, the oak had disappeared, and nothing remained but a blasted stump. When we visited it the next morning, we found the tree shattered in a singular manner. It was not splintered by the shock, but entirely reduced to thin ribbons of wood. I never beheld anything so utterly destroyed. Before this, I was not utterly unacquainted with the more obvious laws of electricity. On this occasion, however, a man of great research in natural philosophy was with us, and, excited by this catastrophe, he entered on the explanation of a theory which was astonishing to me. All that he said threw greatly into the shade the previous lords of my imagination. I at once gave up my former occupations, and in this mood of mind I betook myself to the mathematics and the branches of study appertaining to that science as being worthy of my consideration. Thus strangely are our souls constructed. It was thus that I was to be taught to associate evil with the prosecution of my previous studies and happiness with their disregard. It was a strong effort of the spirit of good, but it was ineffectual. Destiny was too potent, and her immutable laws had decreed my utter and terrible destruction. When I had attained the age of seventeen, my parents resolved that I should become a student at the University of Ingolstadt. My departure was therefore fixed at an early date, but before the day resolved upon could arrive, the first misfortune of my life occurred, an omen, as it were, of my future misery. Elizabeth had caught the scarlet fever, and she was in the greatest danger. During her illness, my mother— Fearing the life of her favourite to be menaced, attended her sickbed at all times. Elizabeth was saved, but my mother sickened, and the looks of her medical attendants prognosticated the worst event. On her deathbed, however, she joined the hands of Elizabeth and myself, and gave us words of fortitude and benignity. My children, she said, my firmest hopes of future happiness were placed on the prospect of your union. This expectation will now be the consolation of your father. I will endeavour to resign myself cheerfully to death, and will indulge a hope of meeting you in another world. She died calmly, and I need not describe the feelings of those whose dearest ties are rent by that irreparable evil. But we still have duties which we ought to perform, and we must continue our course with the rest. My departure for Ingolstadt, which had been deferred by these events, was now again determined upon, and at length arrived. Clerval spent the last evening with us. He had endeavoured to persuade his father to permit him to accompany me, and to become my fellow-student, but in vain. Elizabeth renewed her treaties that I should write often. At morning's dawn, 
I descended to the carriage which was to convey me away, and I threw myself into the chaise and indulged in the most melancholy reflection. I was now alone. At Ingolstadt I must form my own friends and be my own protector, and as my journey proceeded my spirits and hopes rose. At Ingolstadt I alighted and was conducted to my solitary apartment. The next morning, chance, or rather the angel of destruction, led me first to Monsieur Kemper, professor of natural philosophy. He asked me several questions regarding my progress, and I replied carelessly, mentioning the names of my alchemists as the principal authors I had studied. The professor stared. My dear sir, he said, every instant that you have wasted on these books is utterly and entirely lost. You must begin your studies anew. And so saying, he wrote down a list of several books, treating of natural philosophy, which he desired me to procure, and dismissed me, after mentioning a course of lectures he intended to commence the following week, alternating with a Monsieur Waldman, who would lecture upon chemistry. I returned home, not disappointed, for I have said that I had long considered these authors useless whom the professor reprobated, but I returned not at all the more inclined to studies in any shape. I was required to exchange chimeras of boundless grandeur for realities of little worth. Such were my reflections during my first two or three days, but as the ensuing week commenced, I recollected what M. Kemper had said regarding M. Waldman, whom I had never seen. Partly from curiosity and partly from idleness, therefore, I went into the lecturing room where M. Waldman was due to commence. M. Waldman appeared about fifty years of age, and his person was short but remarkably erect. He began his lecture with a recapitulation of the history of chemistry, and then, after having made a few preparatory experiments, he concluded with a panegyric upon modern chemistry, the terms of which I shall never forget. The ancient teachers of this science, said he, promised impossibilities and performed nothing. The modern masters promise very little. But these philosophers have indeed performed miracles. They penetrate into the recesses of nature and show how she works in her hiding places. They have acquired new and unlimited powers. They can command the thunders of heaven and even mock the invisible world with its own shadow. And as he went on, I felt as if my soul were grappling with a palpable enemy. So much has been done, exclaimed my soul, the soul of Frankenstein. More, far more, will I achieve. I closed not my eyes that night. By degrees after the morning's dawn, sleep came. I awoke and resolved to return to my ancient studies and devote myself to a science for which I believed myself to have a natural talent. On the same day I paid M. Waldman a visit. He heard with attention the little narration concerning my studies, and smiled at the names of my masters, but without contempt. I am happy, he said, to have gained a disciple, and if your application equals your ability, I have no doubt of your success. He then took me into his laboratory, and explained to me the use of his various machines, instructing me as to what I ought to procure and which books to read, and I took my leave. Thus ended... A day memorable to me, which decided my future destiny. From this day, natural philosophy, and particularly chemistry, in the most comprehensive sense of the term, became nearly my sole occupation. My ardour was indeed the astonishment of the students, and my proficiency that of the masters. Two years passed in this manner, during which I paid no visit to Geneva, None but those who have experienced them can conceive of the enticements of science. Only when I had become as well acquainted with theory as practice that I no longer depended on my professors at Ingolstadt did I think of returning to my friends and my native town. But an accident happened that protracted my stay. One of the phenomena which had particularly attracted my attention was the structure of the human frame, and indeed any animal endued with life. 
Whence, I often asked myself, did the principle of life proceed? It was a bold question, and one which had ever been considered a mystery. I determined thenceforth to apply myself more particularly to the study of physiology. To examine the causes of life, I concluded that we must first have recourse to death. I therefore became acquainted with the science of anatomy, but this was not sufficient. I must also observe the natural decay and corruption of the human body. I was consequently led to examine the cause and progress of decay, and forced to spend nights in vaults and charnel houses. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted, how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and brain, until from the midst of this darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous, yet so simple, that I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated. Remember, I am not recording the vision of a madman. After days and nights of incredible labour and fatigue, I succeeded in discovering the cause and generation of life. Nay, more, I became capable of bestowing animation upon lifeless matter. The astonishment which I had at first experienced on this discovery soon gave place to delight and rapture. What had been the study and desire of the wisest men since the creation of the world was now within my grasp. I see by your eagerness, and the wonder and hope which your eyes express, my friend, that you expect to be informed of the secret with which I am acquainted. That cannot be. Listen patiently to the end of my story, and you will perceive why I am reserved upon that subject. Learn from me how dangerous is the acquirement of knowledge, and how much happier that man who believes his native town to be the world than he who aspires to become greater than his nature will allow. When I found so astonishing a power placed within my hands, I hesitated a long time concerning the manner in which I should employ it. I doubted at first whether I should attempt the creation of a being like myself, or one of simpler organization, but my imagination was too much exalted by that first success to permit me to doubt of my ability to give life to an animal as complex and wonderful as man. It was with these feelings that I began the creation of a human being. As the minuteness of the parts formed a great hindrance to my speed, I resolved, contrary to my first intention, to make the being of a gigantic stature, that is to say, about eight feet in height and proportionably large. After having spent some months in successfully collecting and arranging my materials, I began. No one can conceive the variety of feelings which bore me onwards like a hurricane in the first enthusiasm of success. A new species would bless me as its creator and source. Many happy and excellent natures would owe their being to me. These thoughts supported my spirits, while I pursued my undertaking with unremitting ardour. My cheek had grown pale with study, and my person had become emaciated with confinement. Sometimes on the very brink of certainty I failed, yet still I clung to the hope which the next day or the next hour might realise. Who shall conceive the horrors of my secret toil as I dabbled among the unhallowed damps of the grave, or tortured the living animal to animate the lifeless clay? In a solitary chamber, or rather a cell, at the top of the house, and separated from all other apartments, I kept my workshop of filthy creation. Winter, spring, and summer passed away during my labours, and it was not until a dreary night of November that I beheld the accomplishment of my toils. With an anxiety that almost amounted to agony, I collected the instruments of life around me that I might infuse a spark of being into the lifeless thing that lay at my feet. 
It was already one in the morning. The rain pattered miserably against the panes, and my candle was nearly burnt out. When, by the glimmer of the half-extinguished light, I saw the dull yellow eye of the creature open. It breathed hard, and a convulsive motion agitated its limbs. How can I describe my emotions at this catastrophe, or how delineate the wretch whom, with such infinite pains and care, I had endeavoured to form? His limbs were in proportion, and I had selected his features as beautiful, beautiful, great God! His yellow skin scarcely covered the work of muscles and arteries beneath. His hair was of lustrous black and flowing, his teeth of pearly whiteness, but these luxuriances only formed a more horrid contrast with his watery eyes that seemed almost of the same colour as the dun white sockets in which they were set, his shriveled complexion and straight black lips. Unable to endure the aspect of the being I had created, I rushed out of the room and continued a long time traversing my bedchamber. At length I threw myself on the bed in my clothes, but it was in vain. I slept, but I spent the night wretchedly. Morning, dismal and wet, at length dawned. I issued straightway into the streets, as if to avoid the wretch whom I feared every turning of the street would present to my view. I came at length opposite to the inn at which the various carriages usually stopped. Here I paused with my eyes fixed on a coach drawing near, observing that it was the Swiss diligence. It stopped just where I was standing, and on the door being opened, I perceived Henry Clerval, who on seeing me instantly sprung out. "'My dear Frankenstein!' exclaimed he. "'How fortunate that you should be here at the very moment of my alighting!' I grasped his hand, and in a moment forgot my horror and misfortune. I felt for the first time in many months calm and serene joy. I welcomed my friend, therefore, in the most cordial manner, and we walked towards the college. "'It gives me the greatest delight to see you,' I said to him at length. "'But tell me how you left my father, brothers, and Elizabeth.' "'Very well, and very happy, only a little uneasy that they hear from you so seldom. "'But, my dear Frankenstein, how very ill you appear, so thin and pale.' "'I trembled, and could not endure to think of the occurrences of the preceding night. "'We soon arrived at my college, and I then reflected, and the thought made me shiver, "'that the creature whom I had left in my apartment might still be there, alive and walking about. I darted up towards my own room. I paused, and then threw the door forcibly open. But nothing appeared. I stepped fearfully in. The apartment was empty, and my bedroom was also freed from its hideous guest. I could hardly believe that so great a good fortune could have befallen me. But when I became assured that my enemy had indeed fled— I clapped my hands for joy and ran down to Clerval. We ascended into my room, and the servant presently brought breakfast. But I was unable to contain myself. I jumped over the chairs, clapped my hands, and laughed aloud. "'My dear Victor,' cried he, "'what, for God's sake, is the matter? Do not laugh in that manner. What is the cause of all this?' "'Do not ask me.' cried I, putting my hands before my eyes, for I thought I saw the dreaded spectre glide into the room. He can tell. Oh, save me, save me. I imagined that the monster seized me. I struggled furiously and fell down in a fit. Poor Clerval, what must have been in his feelings? A meeting which he anticipated with such joy so strangely turned to bitterness. For well, this was the commencement of a nervous fever which confined me for several months. During all that time Henry was my only nurse. By very slow degrees, and with frequent relapses that alarmed and grieved my friend, I recovered, and in a short time I became as cheerful as before. "'Dearest Clerval,' exclaimed I, "'how shall I ever repay you?' You will repay me entirely if you get well as fast as you can. And since you appear in such good spirits, I shall speak to you of one subject. I will not mention it if it agitates you, but your father and cousin would be very happy if they received a letter from you in your own handwriting. 
Is that all, my dear Henry? But of course. If this is your present temper, therefore, my friend, you will perhaps be glad to see a letter that has been lying here some days for you. It is from your cousin, I believe. Clerval then put the following letter into my hands. It was from my own Elizabeth. My dearest cousin, you have been ill, yet Clerval writes that indeed you are getting better. Since you left us, but one change has taken place in our little household. Do you remember on what occasions Justine Moritz entered our family? Probably you do not. She was a great favourite of yours. Well, she was forced to return to her widowed mother, who did not care for her, for many months, and we thought we had lost her. She was very unhappy. And then suddenly her mother died, and she has returned to the bosom of this family. We are all so very pleased. I must also just say a few words to you of little darling William. I wish you could see him. He is very tall for his age, with sweet, laughing blue eyes. When he smiles, two little dimples appear on each cheek, which are rosy with health. I have written myself into better spirits, dear cousin, but do write back. Adieu. Take care of yourself, and I entreat you to write. Elizabeth Lavenza, Geneva, March 18th. Dear, dear Elizabeth, I exclaimed, I will write instantly. I wrote, and this exertion greatly fatigued me, but my convalescence had commenced. In another fortnight I was able to leave my chamber. One of my first duties on my recovery was to introduce Clerval to the several professors of the university. Clerval had never sympathized in my tastes for natural sciences, and, hating my former studies, I felt great relief in being the fellow pupil with my friend. Summer passed away, and my return to Geneva was fixed for the latter end of autumn, but being delayed, winter and snow arrived, and my journey was retarded to the ensuing spring. The month of May had already commenced when Henry proposed a pedestrian tour in the environs of Ingolstadt, that I might bid a farewell. The countryside was glorious, and we returned to my college in high spirits to find the following letter from my father. My dear Victor, you have probably waited impatiently for a letter to fix the date of your return. I was at first tempted to write only a few lines, merely mentioning the day on which I should expect you, but that would be a cruel kindness, and I dare not do it. What would be your surprise, my son, when you expect a happy and glad welcome to behold, on the contrary, tears? and wretchedness. And how, Victor, can I relate our misfortune? I wish to prepare you for the woeful news, but I know it is impossible. William is dead. That sweet child, whose smiles delighted and warmed my heart, Victor, he is murdered. I will not attempt to console you, but will merely relate the circumstances of the transaction. Last Thursday, May 7th, I, my niece, and your two brothers went to walk in Plain Palais. It was already dusk before we thought of returning, and then we discovered that William and Ernest, who had gone on before, were not to be found. We accordingly rested on a seat. Presently Ernest came and inquired if we had seen his brother, that William had run away, and that he vainly sought for him. The account rather alarmed us, and we continued to search for him until night fell, when Elizabeth conjectured that he might have returned to the house. He was not there. We returned again with torches, for I could not rest. About five in the morning, I discovered my lovely boy, stretched on the grass, livid and motionless. The print of the murderer's finger was on his neck. He was conveyed home and the anguish that was visible in my countenance betrayed the secret to Elizabeth. Clasping her hands, she exclaimed, O oh God, I have murdered my darling child. She fainted, and when she was restored, it was only to weep and sigh. She told me that that same evening William had teased her to let him wear a very valuable miniature that she possessed of your mother. This picture is gone. 
and was doubtless the temptation which urged the murderer to the deed. Come, Victor, you alone can console Elizabeth. Come, Victor, not brooding thoughts of vengeance, but with feelings of peace and gentleness. Enter the house of mourning with kindness and affection for those who love you. Your affectionate and afflicted father, Alphonse Frankenstein. Geneva, May 12th. Clerval, who had watched my countenance as I read this letter, was surprised to observe the despair that succeeded to the joy I at first expressed on receiving news from my friends. My dear Frankenstein, exclaimed Henry, my dear friend, what has happened? I motioned to him to take the letter, and tears also gushed from Clerval's eyes as he read the account of my misfortune. I can offer you no consolation, my friend, said he. Your disaster is irreparable. What do you intend to do? To go instantly to Geneva. Come with me, Henry, to order the horses. During our walk, Clerval endeavoured to say a few words of consolation. He could only express his heartfelt sympathy. Dear lovely child, to die so miserably, to feel the murderer's grasp. How much more a murderer that could destroy such radiant innocence. These words impressed themselves heavily on my mind. But now, as the horses arrived, I hurried into a cabriolet and bade farewell to my friend. My journey was very melancholy. At first I wished to hurry on, but when I drew near my native town, I slackened my progress. I could hardly sustain the multitude of feelings that crowded into my mind, and as I drew nearer home, grief and fear overcame me. But as night had also closed the round, and it was completely dark when I arrived in the environs of Geneva, I found the gates of the town were already shut, and I was obliged to spend the night at Secheron, a village at a distance half a league from the city. I was unable to rest, and so I resolved to visit the spot where my poor William had been murdered. I crossed the lake to arrive at Plain Palais, and during this short voyage I saw the lightnings playing on the summit of Mont Blanc. On landing, I ascended a low hill that I might observe its progress, and the thunder burst with a great crash over my head. Vivid flashes of lightning dazzled my eyes, illuminating the lake, making it appear like a vast sheet of fire. While I watched the tempest, I clasped my hands and exclaimed aloud, William, dear angel, this is thy funeral, this thy dirge. But as I said these words, I perceived in the gloom a figure, which stole from behind a clump of trees near me. I stood fixed, gazing intently. I could not be mistaken. A flash of lightning illuminated the object and discovered its shape plainly to me. Its gigantic stature and the deformity of its aspect, more hideous than belongs to humanity, instantly informed me that it was the wretch, the filthy demon to whom I had given life. What did he there? Could he be, I shuddered at the conception, the murderer of my brother? No sooner did that idea cross my mind than I became convinced of its truth. My teeth chattered, and I was forced to lean against a tree for support. The figure passed me quickly, and I lost it in the gloom. Nothing in human shape could have destroyed that fair child. He was the murderer. I could not doubt it. I remained motionless. The thunder ceased, and the scene was enveloped in impenetrable darkness. I resolved in my mind the events which I had until now sought to forget. Alas, I had turned loose into the world a depraved wretch whose delight was in carnage and misery. Had he not murdered my brother? No one can conceive the anguish I suffered during the remainder of the night which I spent cold and wet in the open air. Day dawned, and thus I directed my steps to the town and to my father's house. My first thought was to discover what I knew of the murderer and cause instant pursuit to be made. But I paused, and thought of the story I had to tell. I well knew that if any other had communicated such a relation to me, I should have looked upon it as the ravings of insanity. Who could arrest such a creature? 
I resolved to remain silent. It was about five in the morning when I entered my father's house. I told the servants not to disturb the family and went into the library. There I gazed on the picture of my mother over the mantelpiece, beneath which was a miniature of William, and my tears flowed. While I was thus engaged, Ernest entered, and a sorrowful delight came over him. Welcome, my dearest Victor, was his instant greeting, and then tears, unrestrained, fell from my brother's eyes. A sense of mortal agony crept over my frame, and I tried to calm Ernest. I inquired of my father, and then I named my cousin. She, most of all, said Ernest, requires consolation. She accused herself of having caused the death of my brother, and that made her very wretched. But since the murderer has been discovered... The murderer discovered? Good God, how can that be? Who could attempt to pursue him? It is impossible. I do not know what you mean, replied my brother in accents of wonder. But to us the discovery we have made completes our misery. Indeed, who would credit that Justine Moritz, who was so amiable and fond of all the family, could suddenly become capable of so appalling a crime? Justine Moritz? Poor girl, is she accused? But no one believes this, surely. No one did at first, but several circumstances came out that have almost forced conviction upon us, and her own behaviour has been so confused as to add weight to the accusation. But she will be tried today, and then you will hear all. He related that the morning on which the murder of poor William had been discovered, Justine had been taken ill and confined to her bed for several days. During this interval, one of the servants had discovered in the pocket of her apparel the picture of my mother which had been around William's neck. The servant showed it to one of the others, and, without mentioning it to the family, went straight away to the magistrate. Justine was apprehended and charged, confirming the suspicion by her great confusion. "'You are all mistaken,' I said. "'I know the murderer. Justine, poor Justine, is innocent.' At that moment my father entered, and after greetings Ernest said, Papa, Victor knows the murderer. Justine is innocent. If she is, God forbid that she should suffer today, and I hope sincerely that she will be acquitted. This speech calmed me. I was firmly convinced in my own mind that Justine, and indeed every human being, was guiltless of this murder. I had no fear, therefore, that any circumstantial evidence could be brought forward to convict her. We were soon joined by Elizabeth, and she welcomed me with the greatest affection. Your arrival, my dear cousin, she said, fills me with hope. You, perhaps, will be able to save poor Justine. She is innocent, my Elizabeth, and that shall be proved. Fear nothing. And at this Elizabeth wept. We passed a few sad hours until eleven o'clock, when the trial was due to commence. My father and the rest of the family being obliged to attend as witnesses, I accompanied them to the court. The appearance of Justine was calm. When she entered the court, she threw her eyes round it and quickly discovered where we were seated. A look of sorrowful affection seemed to attest her utter guiltlessness. The trial began, and after the advocate against her had stated the charge, several witnesses were called. Several strange facts combined against her which might have staggered anyone who had not such proof of her innocence as I had. Then Justine was called on for her defence. She had been much upset by the evidence against her, but she collected her powers and spoke in an audible, although variable, voice. "'God knows,' she said, how entirely I am innocent. But I do not pretend that my protestations should acquit me. I rest my innocence on a plain and simple explanation of the facts which have been adduced against me, and faith in the character I have always borne. She then related that, on the night of the murder, by permission of Elizabeth, she had been staying with an aunt out of the town. On her return she heard of the lost child and spent some hours looking for William, until she was too late to return, and spent several hours in a barn. 
She was tired and confused when she woke, and if by accident she had gone near to the spot of the murder, she knew this not. Concerning the picture, she could give no account. I know how heavily and fatally this weighs against me, continued the unhappy victim, but I have no power of explaining it. Did the murderer place it there? I know of no opportunity for him to do so. I therefore commit my cause to the justice of the judges. Several witnesses were called who spoke well of her, but fear and hatred of the crime rendered them timorous. Eventually Elizabeth, as a last resort, desired permission to speak to the court. I am, said she, the cousin of the unhappy child who was murdered. I have lived in the same house as the accused, at one time for five, and at another for nearly two years. During all that time she appeared to me the most amiable and benevolent of human creatures. She was warmly attached to the child who is now dead, and for my own part I do not hesitate to say that, notwithstanding all the evidence produced against her, I believe and rely on her total innocence. A murmur of approbation followed Elizabeth's simple but powerful appeal, but it was excited by her generous inference, and public indignation turned with renewed violence on what they saw as the ingratitude of Justine. My own agitation and anguish was extreme during the trial, and I passed a night of unmingled wretchedness. In the morning I went to the court. The ballots had been thrown. They were all black and Justine was condemned. And on the morrow, Justine died. The innocent perished on the scaffold as a murderess. From the tortures of my own heart, I turned to contemplate the deep and voiceless grief of my Elizabeth. This also was my doing, and my father's woe, and the desolation of that late so smiling home, all was the work of my thrice accursed hands. This state of my mind preyed upon my health. Solitude became my only consolation, and I could only respond to my father with a look of despair, and endeavour to hide myself from his company. About this time we retired to our house at Belrive. This change was particularly agreeable to me, for I was now free. Often I took the boat and passed many hours upon the water. I was often tempted to plunge into the silent lake, but I was restrained when I thought of the heroic and suffering Elizabeth, whom I tenderly loved. I wished that peace would revisit my mind, but that could not be. Remorse extinguished every hope, and I lived in daily fear that the monster whom I had created should perpetrate some new wickedness. When I reflected on his crimes and malice, I wished to see him again, that I might avenge his crimes and my own. Sometimes I could cope with the sullen despair that overwhelmed me, but at other times the whirlwind passions of my soul drove me to seek, by bodily exercise and by change, some relief. It was during an access of this kind that I suddenly left my home, and bending my steps towards the near Alpine villages, sought in the magnificence, the eternity of such scenes, to forget myself and my sorrows. I performed the first part of my journey on horseback. I afterwards hired a mule, and the weight of my spirit was sensibly lightened as I plunged yet deeper into the ravine of the Arve. The mighty Alps, white and shining pyramids and domes, towered above all, as though they belonged to another earth, the habitations of another race of beings. As soon after this, I entered the valley of Chamonix, and looked up at the supreme and magnificent Mont Blanc. A tingling, long-lost sense of pleasure began to come across me in my journey, and maternal nature herself bade me weep no more. At length I arrived at the village of Chamonix, where I entered a guest-house, and exhaustion succeeded to the extreme fatigue both of body and mind which I had endured. I spent the following day roaming through the valley. The abrupt sides of vast mountains were before me. The icy wall of the glacier overhung me, and the solemn silence of this glorious presence chamber of imperial nature was broken only by the brawling waves or the fall of some vast fragment. These great and magnificent scenes afforded me the greatest consolation that I was capable of receiving. 
But when the next morning I awoke, a dark melancholy clouded every thought. The rain was pouring in torrents. The thick mists hid the summit of the mountains. Still I would penetrate their misty veil. My mule was brought to the door, and I resolved to ascend to the summit of Montanvert. The ascent is precipitous, and it is a scene terrifically desolate. As I climbed, I looked on the valley beneath. Vast mists were rising from the rivers. It was nearly noon when I arrived at the top of the ascent and descended upon the glacier. The opposite mountain is a bare perpendicular rock, and after two hours clambering across the ice, I rested in a recess of the rock, gazing at the wonders of Mont Blanc and Mont Envers. But as I stood thus, I suddenly beheld the figure of a man at some distance, advancing towards me with superhuman speed. He bounded over the crevices in the ice, among which I had walked with caution. His stature seemed to exceed that of a man. I was troubled. A mist came over my eyes, and I felt a faintness seize me. I perceived, as the shape came nearer, that it was the wretch whom I had created, and I trembled with rage and horror, resolving to close with him in mortal combat. Swiftly he approached, and his countenance bespoke bitter anguish, combined with disdain and malignity, while its unearthly ugliness rendered it almost too horrible for human eyes. But I scarcely observed this. I recovered only to overwhelm him with words expressive of furious detestation and contempt. Devil! I exclaimed. Do you dare approach me? Oh, that I could, with the extinction of your miserable existence, restore those victims whom you so diabolically murdered. I expected this reception, said the demon. All men hate the wretched. Yet you, my creator, detest and spurn me, thy creature, to whom thou art bound by ties only dissoluble by the annihilation of one of us. Do your duty towards me and I will do mine towards you and the rest of mankind. If you comply with my conditions, I will leave them and you at peace. But if you refuse, I will glut the maw of death until it be satiated with the blood of your remaining friends. Abhorred monster, fiend that thou art, you reproach me with your creation. Come on, then, that I may extinguish the spark which I so negligently bestowed. My rage was without bounds, and I sprang at him, but he easily eluded me and said, Be calm. I entreat you to hear me before you give vent to your hatred on my devoted head. Have I not suffered enough that you seek to increase my misery? Life... Although it may only be an accumulation of anguish, is dear to me, and I will defend it. Oh, Frankenstein, be not equitable to every other, and trample upon me alone. I ought to be thy Adam, but I am rather the fallen angel. Make me happy, and I shall again be virtuous. Be gone! I will not hear you! There can be no community between you and me. We are enemies. Oh, can I move thee? Believe me, Frankenstein, I was benevolent. My soul glowed with love and humanity. But am I not alone? Miserably alone. You, my creator, abhor me. What hope can I gather from your fellow creatures who owe me nothing? The desert mountains and dreary glaciers are my only refuge. I have wandered here many days. Listen to my tale. When you have heard that, abandon or commiserate me, as you shall judge that I deserve. But hear me. Listen to me, Frankenstein. You accuse me of murder, and yet you would, with a satisfied conscience, destroy your own creature. Oh, praise the eternal justice of man! But why do you call to my remembrance, I rejoined, circumstances of which I shudder to reflect, that I have been the miserable origin and author? Cursed be the day when you first saw the light! Cursed be the hands that formed you! Relieve me from the sight of your detested form! 
By the virtues that I once possessed, I demand this from you, the creature replied. Hear my tale! It is long and strange, and the temperature of this place is not fitting to your finer sensations. Come to the hut upon the mountains. The sun is yet high. Before it descends, you will have heard my story and can decide. On you it rests whether I quit forever the neighborhood of man and lead a harmless life, or become the scourge of your fellow creatures and the author of your own speedy ruin. As he said this, he led the way across the ice. I followed. I was partly urged by curiosity, and compassion confirmed my resolution. For the first time I felt what the duties of a creator towards his creature were, and that I ought to render him happy before I complained of his wickedness. We crossed the ice, and ascending the opposite rock, finally entered the hut. With a heavy heart, I seated myself by the fire which the fiend had lighted, and he began his tale. It is with considerable difficulty that I remember the original era of my being. It was indeed a long time before I began to distinguish between the operations of my various senses. I know I walked, and as I walked the light became oppressive and the heat wearying, so I sought a place where I could receive shade. This was the forest near Ingolstadt, and here I lay by the side of a brook until I felt tormented by hunger and thirst. I ate some berries and drunk from a brook, and then was overcome by sleep. It was dark when I awoke. I felt cold. Before I had quit your apartment, I had covered myself with some clothes, but these were insufficient, and feeling pain invade me on all sides, I sat down and wept. Soon, however, a gentle light stole over the heavens and gave me a sensation of pleasure. I felt well enough to search for berries, and while I was so engaged, I found a huge cloak with which I covered myself. No distinct ideas occupied my mind, and I sat down on the ground. Several changes of day and night passed, and the orb of night had greatly lessened, when I began to distinguish my sensations from each other. And so, wrapping myself in my cloak, I struck out across the woods. A great fall of snow had taken place, and as I walked I longed to obtain food and shelter. It was about seven in the morning when I perceived a small hut on a rising ground. This was a new experience for me, but finding the door open, I entered. An old man sat in the hut, near a fire, over which he prepared breakfast. But perceiving me, he shrieked loudly and ran out across the fields. But I was enchanted by the hut, and after devouring the shepherd's breakfast, I lay down among some straw and slept. It was noon when I awoke, and, allured by the warmth of the sun, I determined to recommence my travels— I proceeded across the fields until I came to a village. The huts, the neater cottages and stately houses engaged my admiration by turns. One of the best I entered, but I had hardly placed my foot within the door before the children shrieked and one of the women fainted. The whole village was roused and many attacked me until, grievously bruised, I escaped to the open country and fearfully took refuge in a low hovel. This hovel, it turned out, joined a cottage of a neat and pleasant appearance, but I dared not enter it. My place of refuge was so low that I could with difficulty sit upright in it, and although the wind entered it by innumerable chinks, I found it an agreeable asylum from the snow and rain. Here then I retreated, 
happy to find a shelter from the inclemencies of the weather, but more from the barbarity of man. I resolved to reside in this hovel, and I ate a little breakfast that I had procured. I was about to remove a plank to procure a little water when I heard a step, and looking through a chink I beheld a young creature with a pail on her head. The girl was young and of gentle demeanour, yet she was meanly dressed. As she walked along, a young man met her, took the pail from her head, and together they returned to the cottage. On examining my dwelling, I found that one of the windows of the cottage had formerly occupied a part of it, but the panes had been filled up with wood. In one of these was a small and almost imperceptible chink through which the eye could just penetrate. Through this crevice a small room was visible, whitewashed and clean, but very bare of furniture. In one corner, near a small fire, sat an old man. The young girl presently took something out of a drawer, and handing it to the old man, he began to play, and to produce a sound sweeter than the nightingale. The silver hair and benevolent countenance of the aged cottager won my reverence, while the gentle manners of the girl enticed my love. On finishing his tune, the old man raised the girl and smiled with such kindness and affection that I felt sensations of a peculiar and overpowering nature. They were a mixture of pain and pleasure such as I had never before experienced, and I withdrew unable to bear these emotions. Night quickly shut in, but to my extreme wonder I found that the cottagers had a means of prolonging light, and was delighted to find that the setting of the sun did not put an end to my pleasure in watching my neighbours. What chiefly struck me was the gentle manners of these people, and I longed to join them, but dared not. I remembered too well the treatment I had suffered the night before from the barbarous villagers. The cottagers rose the next morning before the sun, and the day was passed in the same routine which preceded it. The old man, whom I soon perceived to be blind, employed his leisure hours on his instrument or in contemplation. Nothing could exceed the love and respect which the younger cottagers showed towards their venerable companion. By degrees I made a discovery of still greater moment. I found that these people possessed the method of communicating their experience and feelings to each other by articulate sounds. By great application I discovered the names that were given to some of the most familiar objects of discourse. I learnt also the names of the cottagers themselves. I cannot express the delight I felt. The young man, whose name I discovered was Felix, worked all day from before sunrise, but in the winter there was little work to do, and then he sometimes read to the old man and to his sister, whom I discovered was named Agatha. This reading had puzzled me extremely at first, but by degrees I discovered that he uttered many of the same sounds when he read as when he talked. I conjectured, therefore, that he found on the paper signs of speech which he understood, and I ardently longed to understand these too, but how was that possible? I improved continually, however, in learning to speak, but not, I believe, sufficiently to carry out a conversation, for I perceived that, although I easily longed to discover myself to the cottages, I ought not to make the attempt until I had first become master of their language. I longed to discover the motives and feelings of these beautiful creatures, and why they were still sometimes sad. I formed in my imagination a thousand pictures of presenting myself to them, and I imagined they would be disgusted until, by my gentle demeanour and conciliating words, I should first win their favour and afterwards their love. Spring advanced rapidly. The weather became fine and the skies cloudless. It was on one of those days when my cottagers periodically rested from labour that I observed the countenance of Felix melancholy. 
The old man was just recommencing on his music when there was a tap at the door. It was a lady on horseback, accompanied by a countryman as a guide. The lady was covered with a thick black veil, but she spoke the name of Felix, and on hearing this Felix came up, and the lady threw back her veil, and I beheld a countenance of angelic beauty and expression. Felix seemed ravished with delight. He assisted her to dismount, and, dismissing the countryman, she entered the cottage. I soon perceived that, although the stranger uttered articulate sounds, she appeared to have a language of her own. They made many signs which I did not comprehend, but I saw that her presence diffused gladness through the cottage. Some hours passed, and presently I found, by the frequent recurrence of some sound which the stranger repeated after them, that she was endeavouring to learn their language, and the idea occurred to me that I should make use of the same instructions to the same end. When they separated, Felix kissed the hand of the stranger and said, Good night, sweet Safi. The days now passed as peaceably as before, with the sole alteration that joy had taken the place of sadness in the countenances of my friends. Safi and I improved rapidly in the knowledge of language, so that in two months I began to understand most of the words uttered by my protectors. While I improved in speech, I also learned the science of letters as it was taught to the stranger, and this opened before me a wide field for wonder and delight. Of my creation and creator I was ignorant, but I knew that I possessed no money, no friends, no kind of property. I was, besides, endued with a figure hideously deformed and loathsome. I was not even of the same nature as man. Was I, then, a monster? a blot upon the earth. Other lessons were impressed upon me. I heard of the difference of sexes, the birth and growth of children, how the father doted on the smiles of the infant and the sallies of the older child. But where were my friends and relations? No father had watched my infant days. No mother had blessed me with smiles. Or if they had, all my past life was now a blot. What was I? The question again recurred, to be answered only with groans. Some time elapsed before I learned the history of my friends, and it was one which could not fail to impress itself deeply on my mind, for this good family had originally come from France, where they had lived a comfortable and happy life under the name de Lacy. But fortune had compelled them to aid the escape of Safi's father from prison, where he was held under false accusation, and the innocent captive returned to his home in Constantinople. As a punishment, the government of France had taken all their beloved possessions and their home and banished the family. Meanwhile, Safi's father had all but promised her to Felix in marriage, but she had disappeared, and he knew not where she was. And such were the matters which had troubled the heart of Felix, until the arrival of Safi infused new life into his soul. By her part, she had disobeyed her father, and on his sailing to Constantinople with a promise to return, she had left Italy and searched through all Germany to find the family. This was the history of my beloved cottagers, and it impressed me deeply. But I must not omit a circumstance which occurred in the beginning of the month of August in the same year. One night, during my accustomed visit to the neighbouring wood where I collected my food and brought home firing, I found on the ground a leathern portmanteau containing several articles of dress and some books. 
I eagerly seized the prize and returned with it to my hovel. Fortunately, the books were written in the language, the elements of which I had learned. They consisted of Paradise Lost, a volume of Plutarch's Lives, and The Sorrows of Werther. The possession of these treasures gave me extreme delight, and I now continually studied. As I read, however, I applied much to my own feelings and condition. Paradise Lost particularly excited deep emotions. Like Adam, I was apparently united by no link to any other being in existence. But he was allowed to converse with and acquire knowledge from beings of a superior nature, but I was wretched, helpless, and alone. Many times I considered Satan as the fitter emblem of my existence, for the bitter gall of envy rose in me. Another circumstance then strengthened and confirmed these feelings. Soon after my arrival in my hovel, I discovered some papers in the pocket of the dress which I had taken from your laboratory. At first I had neglected them, but now that I was able to decipher the characters, I began to study them with diligence. It was your journal of the four months that preceded my creation. You doubtless recollect these papers. Here they are. Everything is related in them which bears reference to my accursed origin. And I sickened as I read, Accursed Creator. I exclaimed in agony, Why did you form a monster so hideous that even you turned from me in disgust? God in pity made man beautiful and alluring. Even Satan had his companions. But I am solitary and abhorred. These were my reflections of my hours of solitude and despondency, but when I contemplated the cottages, I persuaded myself that when they should become acquainted with my admiration of their virtues, they would feel compassion for me and overlook my personal deformity. I cherished hope, but it vanished when I beheld my person reflected in water or my shadow in the moonshine. One day, when the sun shone on the red leaves that strewed the ground and diffused cheerfulness, although it denied warmth, and the old man played on his guitar alone, I knocked on the cottage door. My heart beat quick. Who is there? said the old man. Come in. I entered. Pardon this intrusion, said I. I am a traveller in want of a little rest. It would greatly oblige me if you would allow me to remain a few minutes before the fire. Enter, said de Lacy, and I will try in what manner I can to relieve your wants. My children are from home, and as you see, I am blind. Do not trouble yourself, my kind host. It is warmth and rest only that I need. I sat down, and a silence ensued. I knew that every minute was precious to me. Yet I remained irresolute. By your language, stranger, I suppose you are my countryman. Are you French? No, but I was educated by a French family. I am now going to claim the protection of some friends whom I sincerely love, and of whose favour I have some hopes. Are they German? No. They are French, but let us change the subject. I am an unfortunate and deserted creature. I look around and have no relation or friend upon earth. These amiable people to whom I go have never seen me, and I am full of fears. If these friends are good and amiable, do not despair. They are kind. They are the most excellent creatures in the world, but unfortunately they are prejudiced against me. I have good dispositions, and my life has been hitherto harmless, but where they ought to see a feeling and kind friend, they behold only a detestable monster. Where do these friends reside? Near this spot. The old man paused. If 
you will unreservedly confide to me the particularities of your tale. I perhaps may be of use in undeceiving them. Excellent man, I thank you, and trust that by your aid I shall not be driven from the society and sympathy of your fellow creatures. At that moment I heard the steps of my younger protectors. I had not a moment to lose. Seizing the hand of the old man, I cried, Now is the time! Save and protect me! You and your family are the friends I seek. Do not desert me in your hour of trial. Great God! exclaimed the man. Who are you? At that instant the cottage door was opened, and Felix, Agatha, and Safi entered. Who can describe their horror? Agatha fainted, and Safi rushed from the cottage. Felix darted forward, and with supernatural force tore me from his father, to whose knees I clung. In a transport of fury, he dashed me to the ground and struck me violently with a stick. I could have torn him limb from limb, but my heart sank. I quitted the cottage, and in the general tumult escaped unperceived to my hovel. Cursed, cursed creator! From that moment I declared everlasting war against the species of man, and more than all, against him who had formed me and sent me forth to this insupportable misery. I returned to my cottage cautiously, but found all silent. I crept into my hovel to wait for my family, but there was no sound, and then I heard Felix speaking to a stranger. It is utterly useless, he said. We can never again inhabit your cottage. My wife and my sister will never recover from their horror. And with that he fled, and I never saw any of the family of de Lacy more. I continued in my hovel for the remainder of the day in a state of utter and stupid despair. For the first time the feelings of hatred and revenge filled my bosom. As night advanced I placed a variety of combustibles around the cottage, and as a fierce wind arose from the woods I lighted the straw, and the cottage was quickly enveloped by the flames. As soon as I was convinced that no assistance could save any part of the habitation, I quitted the scene. But how was I to direct myself? At length, the thought of you crossed my mind. To whom could I apply with more aptness? You had mentioned Geneva in your papers, and I knew from my studies that I must travel in a southwesterly direction to reach that town. From you I determined to seek that justice which I had vainly attempted to gain from any other human. After many months I reached the environs of Geneva. I retired to a hiding place, and light sleep was just relieving me from the pain of reflection when I was disturbed by the approach of a beautiful child. Suddenly, as I gazed on him, an idea seized me that this little creature was unprejudiced and had lived too short a time to have imbibed a horror of deformity. If, therefore, I could seize him and educate him as my companion and friend, I should not be so desolate in this peopled earth. Urged by this impulse, I seized the boy. As soon as he beheld my form, he placed his hand before his eyes and uttered a shrill scream. I drew his hand forcibly from his face and said, Child, what is the meaning of this? I do not intend to hurt you. Listen to me. He struggled violently. Let me go, he cried. You wish to eat me and tear me to pieces. You are an ogre. Let me go or I will tell my papa. Boy, you will never see your father again. You will come with me. Hideous monster, let me go. My father is a syndic. He is Monsieur Frankenstein. He will punish you. You dare not keep me. Frankenstein, you belong then to my enemy, to him towards whom I have sworn eternal revenge. You shall be my first victim. The child still struggled and cried out epithets which carried despair to my heart. I grasped his throat to silence him, and in a moment he lay dead at my feet. As I fixed my eyes on the child, I saw something glittering on his breast. It was a portrait of a most lovely woman. 
For a few moments I gazed with delight, and then I remembered that I was forever deprived of the delights such beautiful creatures could bestow. Can you wonder that such thoughts transported me with a rage? Overcome with these feelings, I left the spot of the murder and found a barn which had appeared to be empty, but I found a woman sleeping on some straw. Though not as beautiful as the lady in the portrait, she had an agreeable aspect and was blooming in the loveliness of youth. I bent over her and whispered, Awake, fairest, thy love is near, my beloved, awake. At which she began to stir, but a thrill of terror ran through me. Should she indeed awake and see me and curse me and denounce the murderer, the thought was madness, I must fly. But thanks to the lessons of Felix and the sanguinary laws of man, I had learned now to work mischief. I first bent over the maiden and placed the portrait securely in one of the folds of her dress, and then I fled. For some days I haunted the area. Then I wandered towards these mountains, and have ranged through their immense recesses, consumed by a burning passion which only you can satisfy. We may not part until you have promised to comply with my requisition. I am alone and miserable. Man will not associate with me, but one as deformed and horrible as myself would not deny herself to me. My companion must be of the same species and have the same defects. This being you must create. The monster finished speaking and fixed his looks upon me. But I was bewildered, perplexed. The latter part of his tale had kindled anew in me the anger that had died away while he narrated his peaceful life among the cottagers, and I could no longer suppress the rage. I do refuse it. You may render me the most miserable of men, but you shall never make me base in my own eyes. Begone, I have answered you. You are in the wrong, replied the fiend, and instead of threatening, I am content to reason with you. I am malicious because I am miserable. You, my creator, would tear me to pieces and triumph. Remember that. And tell me why I should pity man more than he pities me. What I ask of you is reasonable and moderate. I demand a creature of another sex. Our lives will not be happy, but they will be harmless and free from the misery I now feel. Oh, my creator, make me happy! I was moved. I shuddered when I thought of the possible consequences of my consent, but I felt there was justice in his argument. He saw me change my feeling, and continued urgently, If you consent, neither you nor any other human being shall see us again. Pitiless as you have been to me, I now see compassion in your eyes. Let me seize the favourable moment, and persuade you to promise what I do most ardently desire. After a long pause of reflection, I concluded that the justice due both to him and my fellow creatures demanded of me that I should comply with his request. I said, therefore, I consent to your demand, on your solemn oath to quit Europe forever and every other place in the neighbourhood of man. I swear, he cried, by the sun and by the fire of love that burns my heart, that if you grant my prayer, you shall never behold me again. And fear not, but that when you are ready, I shall appear. And saying this, he suddenly quitted me. I saw him descend the mountain with greater speed than the flight of an angel, and quickly he was lost among the undulations of the ice. Thus I returned home, and entering the house presented myself to the family. My haggard and wild appearance awoke intense alarm, but I answered no question. Scarcely did I speak. I resolved to dedicate myself to my most abhorred task. The prospect of such an occupation was my only reality, and all else a dream. It was after my return from one of my country rambles that my father, calling me aside, 
thus addressed me. I am happy to remark, my dear son, that you have resumed your former pleasures, and yet you still seem unhappy. I confess, my son, that I have always looked forward to your marriage with our dear Elizabeth as the tie of our domestic comfort and the stay of my declining years. But perhaps I have been wrong. You may be regard her as your sister without any wish that she might become your wife. This struggle may occasion your poignant misery. My dear father, reassure yourself. My future hopes and prospects are entirely bound up with my cousin, whom I love dearly. This expression gives me great pleasure. Tell me, therefore, whether you object to an immediate solemnization of the marriage. Do not suppose that I wish to dictate your future happiness, but interpret my words with candor. Alas, to me the idea of an immediate union with my Elizabeth was one of horror and dismay. I was bound by a solemn promise which I dare not break. In addition, I had an insurmountable aversion to the idea of engaging myself in my loathsome task in my father's house while in habits of familiar intercourse with those I loved. These feelings dictated my answer to my father. I knew now I must absent myself from all I loved while thus employed. I expressed, therefore, my desire to visit England, clothing my desires under a guise. The duration of my absence was left to my own choice, but without communicating with me, through paternal kind precaution, my father had taken care to ensure me a travelling companion. He and Elizabeth had arranged that Henry Clerval should join me at Strasbourg. To England, therefore, I was bound, and it was understood that my union with Elizabeth should take place immediately on my return. I now made arrangements for my journey, and it was in the latter end of September that I again quitted my native country. I threw myself into the carriage that was to convey me away, hardly knowing whither I was going. I remembered only, and it was with bitter anguish that I reflected on it, to order that my chemical instruments should be packed to go with me. After some days I arrived at Strasbourg, where I waited two days for Clerval. Beloved friend, his soul overflowed with friendship. On meeting, we agreed to descend the Rhine in a boat from Strasbourg to Rotterdam, whence we travelled to London, and we determined to remain several months in this wonderful and celebrated city. Clerval desired the intercourse of men of genius and talent, but I was principally occupied with the means of obtaining the information necessary for the completion of my promise. I now also began to collect the materials necessary for my new creation, and this was to me like the torture of single drops of water continually falling on the head. After passing some months in London, we received a letter from a person in Scotland who had formerly been our visitor at Geneva, inviting us to visit him in Perth. Clerval eagerly desired to accept this invitation, and I, although I abhorred society, wished to view again mountains and streams, and all the wondrous works with which nature adorns her chosen dwelling places. We quitted London on the 27th of March, and travelled first west to Windsor and Oxford, and then proceeded north to Derby, thence Cumberland and Westmoreland, all this taking several months. Finally we arrived on the banks of the Tay, and travelled on to Perth, where our friend expected us. But I was in no mood to laugh and talk with strangers, and accordingly I told Clerval that I wished to make the tour of Scotland alone. He but entreated me to write often. Having parted from my friend, I determined to visit some remote spot of Scotland, and finish my work in solitude. With this resolution, I traversed the northern highlands and fixed on one of the remotest of the Orkneys as the scene of my labours. On the whole island there were but three miserable huts, and one of these was vacant when I arrived. In this retreat I devoted the morning to labour, but in the evening, when the weather permitted, I walked on the stony beach and listened to the waves as they roared and dashed at my feet, in order to rid my mind of my task. But as I proceeded in my labour, it became every day more horrible and irksome to me. 
During my first experiment, a kind of enthusiastic frenzy had blinded me to the horrors of my employment. But now I went to it in cold blood, and my heart often sickened at the work of my hands. Thus situated, immersed in a solitude, my spirits became unequal, and every moment I feared to meet my persecutor. I sat one evening in my laboratory, and as I sat a train of reflection occurred which led me to consider the effects of what I was now doing. Three years before, I was engaged in the same manner, and had created a fiend whose unparalleled barbarity had desolated my heart. I was now about to form another being of whose disposition I was alike ignorant. She had sworn to quit the neighbourhood of man, but she had not. They might even hate each other. She might turn with disgust to the superior beauty of man. Even if they were to leave Europe and inhabit the deserts, one of the first results for which the demon thirsted would be children, and a race of devils would be propagated on the earth who might make the very existence of the species of man a condition precarious and full of terror. For the first time the wickedness of my promise burst upon me. I shuddered to think that future generations might curse me as their pest. I trembled, and my heart failed within me, when, on looking up, I saw by the light of the moon the demon at the casement. A ghastly grin wrinkled his lips as he gazed on me. Yes, he had followed me through all my travels. As I looked on him, his countenance expressed the utmost extent of malice and treachery, and, trembling with passion, I tore to pieces the thing on which I was engaged. The wretch saw me, and with a howl of devilish despair and revenge withdrew. I left the room, and, locking the door, made a solemn vow in my own heart never to resume my labours. I sought my own apartment. I was alone. Several hours passed, and I remained near my window, gazing on the sea which was almost motionless. Suddenly I was arrested by the paddling of oars near the shore, and a person landed close to my door. A few minutes after, I heard the creaking of my door, and I trembled from head to foot. Presently I heard the sound of footsteps along the passage. The door opened, and the wretch whom I dreaded appeared. Shutting the door, he approached me and said in a smothered voice, You have destroyed the work which you began. What is it that you intend? Do you dare to break your promise? I have endured many months of toil and agony following your every move. I have endured incalculable fatigue, cold and hunger. Do you dare to destroy my hopes? Be gone! I do break my promise. Never will I create another like yourself, equal in deformity and wickedness. Slave! I before reasoned with you, but you have proved yourself unworthy of my condescension. You are my creator, but I am your master. Obey! The hour of my irresolution is past, and the period of your power has arrived. Be gone! I am firm, and your words shall only exasperate my rage. The monster saw the determination in my face. Shall each man, he cried, find a wife for his bosom, and each beast have his mate, and I be alone? I had feelings of affection, and they were requited by detestation and scorn. Man, you may hate, but beware, you shall repent of the injuries you inflict. Devil, cease! I have declared my resolution. It is well. I shall go. But remember, I shall be with you on your wedding night. I started forward and exclaimed, Villain, 
Before you sign my death warrant, be sure that you are yourself safe. I would have seized him, but he eluded me, and in a few minutes I saw him in his boat, soon lost among the waves. All was again silent, but his words rang in my ears. I will be with you on your wedding night. In that hour, I should die and extinguish his malice. The prospect did not move me to fear, yet when I thought of my beloved Elizabeth and her endless sorrow, tears, the first I had shed for months, streamed from my eyes. The night passed away and I left the house. I walked about the aisle like a restless spectre. When it became noon, I lay down on the grass, was satisfying my hunger with an oaten cake, when I saw a fishing boat land close to me, and one of the men brought me a package. It contained letters from Geneva, and one from Clerval entreating me to join him. He was wearing away his time fruitlessly, and could not delay his departure any longer. This letter in a degree recalled me to life, and I determined to quit the island. Yet... There was first a task I must perform. The next morning, at daybreak, I summoned sufficient courage and unlocked the door of my laboratory. The remains of the half-finished creature whom I had destroyed lay scattered on the floor. With trembling hands I conveyed the instruments out of the room and placed the offending relics of my work into a large basket with a great quantity of stones, determining to throw them into the sea that very night. After thence completing my tasks for departure, I waited for an appropriate time to set sail. Between two and three in the morning the moon rose, and I then putting my basket aboard a little skiff, sailed out about four miles from the shore. The scene was perfectly solitary. At one time the moon was suddenly overspread by a thick cloud, and I took advantage and cast my basket into the sea and sailed away. The wind was now from the northeast and began to drive me from the coast from which I had embarked. Hastily I endeavoured to change course, but the boat filled with water. My only resource, therefore, was to drive before the wind, and I felt new sensations of fear. Some hours passed thus, but by degrees, as the sun declined towards the horizon, the wind died away to a breeze, and I suddenly espied a line of high land to the south. Almost spent as I was by fatigue, this sudden certainty of life rushed like a flood of warm joy to my heart. As I turned a small promontory, I perceived a small neat town and a good harbour, which I entered, my heart bounding with joy at my unexpected escape. As I was occupied in fixing the boat, several people crowded towards the spot. "'My good friends,' said I, "'will you be so kind as to tell me the name of this town and inform me where I am?' "'You will know that soon enough.' replied a man with a hoarse voice. Maybe you'll come to a place that will not prove much to your taste, but you will not be consulted as to your quarters, I promise you. I was exceedingly surprised. Why do you answer me so roughly? Surely this is not the custom of Englishmen. I do not know, said the man, what the custom of the English may be, but it is the custom of the Irish to hate villains. Come, sir, you must follow me to Mr. Kerwin's to give account of yourself. Who is Mr. Kerwin? Why am I to give an account of myself? Is not this a free country? Aye, sir, free enough for honest folks. Mr. Kerwin is a magistrate, and you are to give an account of the death of a gentleman who was found murdered here last night. The answer startled me, but I knew myself to be innocent. This could be proved, and so I followed my conductor in silence. The magistrate was a benevolent man with calm and mild manners, but on being introduced to his presence, he looked upon me with severity. About half a dozen men came forward and gave their evidence. One, Daniel Nugent, had been out fishing with his brother-in-law and son when they were forced by the strong wind to land at a creek two miles from town. As the brother-in-law was proceeding along the sand, his foot struck against something, and by the light of the lantern they found the body of a man. Transporting the body to the cottage of an old woman, 
they perceived that this was the body of a handsome young man, about five and twenty years of age. He had apparently been strangled, for there was no sign of violence except the black marks of fingers on his neck. Several other witnesses attested to having seen a lone boat like mine on the waters at this time, and I was severely disturbed by the description of the wound. Mr. Cohen, on hearing the evidence, desired that I should see the corpse to gauge my response, and so I entered the room where the corpse lay and was led up to the coffin. How can I describe my sensation of beholding it? For there was the lifeless form of Henry Clerval stretched before me. I gasped for breath, and throwing myself on the body, I exclaimed, Half my murderous machinations deprived you also, my dearest Henry, of life. Two I have already destroyed. Other victims await their destiny, but you, Clerval, my friend, my benefactor. My frame could no longer support my agonies, and I was carried from the room. For two months I lay in fever on the point of death. My ravings, I heard later, were frightful. As I spoke my native tongue, only Mr. Kerwin understood me, but I frightened all. After two months I found myself awaking, as from a dream, in a prison, on a wretched bed, and I groaned loudly. The sound disturbed an old lady who had been sent to look after me, but it became clear that she cared not for me except to complete her task. All were convinced of my guilt, and who could be interested in a murderer but the hangman for his fee? One day, while I was gradually recovering, Mr. Kerwin entered, and I discovered that he had made every effort for my comfort, despite my supposed guilt. He drew a chair close, and spoke more urgently. But I hope soon evidence will be brought to free you from the criminal charge. Upon being taken ill, I had your papers brought to me, and nearly two months have elapsed since I wrote to Geneva, but now I have reply. Your father is here himself to see you. My father? cried I with pleasure. Is my father indeed come? And with that my father indeed entered my small cell, and the magistrate and nurse quitted the room. We were not allowed to converse for a long time, but my father remained in the vicinity, and eventually the assizes took place. I was found innocent, and allowed to return to my native country with my father. We took our passage on board a vessel bound for Havre de Grasse, and sailed with a fair wind from the Irish shores to the French coast, and thence to Paris. There we were forced to rest for my health's sake, much to my frustration. But just before we were due to depart once more, I received a letter from my beloved Elizabeth, worried that I no longer wished for our marriage. This letter revived in my memory what I had before forgotten, the threat of the fiend, I will be with you on your wedding night. Well, be it so. A deadly struggle would then assuredly take place. Resolute, I wrote to Elizabeth, assuring her of my desire to marry, but mentioning also a single additional thing. I have one secret, Elizabeth, I wrote. A dreadful one, one which will be revealed to you. It will chill your frame with horror, and then, far from being surprised at my misery, you will only wonder that I survive what I have endured. I will confide this tale of misery and terror to you the day after our marriage shall take place, for, my sweet cousin, there must be perfect confidence between us. But until then, I conjure you, do not mention or allude to it. In about a week after the arrival of Elizabeth's letter, we returned to Geneva. The sweet girl welcomed me with warm affection, Yet tears were in her eyes as she beheld my emaciated frame and feverish cheeks. As the period fixed for our marriage drew nearer, I felt my heart sink within me, but I concealed my feelings by an appearance of hilarity that brought smiles and joy to the countenance of my father. Preparations were made, congratulatory visits were received, and all wore a smiling appearance. It was agreed that, immediately after our union, we should proceed to Villa Lavenza and spend our first days of happiness beside the beautiful lake near which it stood. 
In the meantime, I took every precaution to defend myself with pistols and dagger always about me. After the ceremony was performed, a large party assembled at my father's, but it was agreed that Elizabeth and I should commence our journey by water, sleeping that night at Evian and continuing the following day. The sun sank as we landed. We walked for a short time on the shore and then retired to the inn. I had been calm during the day, but so soon as the night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears arose in my mind, and I earnestly entreated my new wife to retire. She left me, and this allowed me to inspect every corner that might afford a retreat to my adversary. I was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened, when suddenly... I heard a shrill and dreadful scream coming from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind and my arms dropped. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins. The scream was repeated and I rushed into the room. Great God, why did I not then expire? There she was, lifeless and inanimate, thrown across the bed, her head hanging down, and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. I fell senseless to the ground. When I recovered, I found myself surrounded by the people of the inn, but the horror of others appeared as a mockery. I escaped to where lay the body of Elizabeth, my love, my wife. The murderous mark of the fiend's grasp was on her neck. While I still hung over her in the agony of despair, I happened to look up, and I saw, at the open window, a figure the most hideous and abhorred. A grin was on the face of the monster. I rushed towards the window, and drawing a pistol from my bosom, fired, but too fast for me he eluded me and rushed to the lake. The report of the pistol brought a crowd into the room, and I pointed to the spot where he had disappeared. We all followed the track with boats, and nets were cast, but to no avail. They proceeded to search the country, and I attempted to follow them, but my head whirled, and I fell at last in utter exhaustion. After a while I arose and returned to the room where the corpse of my beloved lay. I joined sad tears to the mourners there, and then knew that I must return to Geneva and my father as soon as possible. I hired men to row me across the lake and arrived at Geneva. My father and my brother Ernest yet lived, but the former sank under the tidings that I bore. He could not live under the horrors that were accumulated around him. He was unable to rise from his bed, and in a few days he died in my arms. What then became of me? I lost sensation, and chains and darkness were the only objects that pressed upon me, for they had called me mad. Eventually I awoke to revenge, and a month after my release I repaired straightway to a criminal judge and told him the whole strange tale. Eventually he said, I would willingly afford you every aid in your pursuit, but the creature of whom you speak appears to have powers which would put all my exertions to defiance. Besides, some months have elapsed since the commission of his crimes, and no one can conjecture to what place he has wandered. I do not doubt but that he hovers near this spot. But I perceive your thoughts. You do not credit my narrative and do not intend to pursue my enemy with the punishment which is his desert. As I spoke, rage sparkled in his eyes. You are mistaken. I will exert myself, but I fear that all my efforts will prove impracticable. At this I trembled with excess of agitation. You refuse my just demand. I have but one resource, and I devote myself, either in my life or death, to his destruction. I broke from the house angry and disturbed, and retired to meditate on some other mode of action. My first resolution was to quit Geneva forever. I provided myself with a sum of money and departed. And now my wanderings began, which are to cease but with life. When I quitted Geneva, my first labour was to gain some clue by which I might trace the steps of my fiendish enemy. 
As night approached, I found myself at the entrance of the cemetery where William, Elizabeth, and my father reposed. I knelt on the grass and kissed the earth and with quivering lips exclaimed, By the sacred earth, I swear to pursue the demon who caused this misery. Let the cursed and hellish monster drink deep of agony. Let him feel despair. I was answered through the stillness of the night by a loud and fiendish laugh. The laughter died away when a well-known and abhorred voice addressed me in an audible whisper. I am satisfied, miserable wretch. You have determined to live, and I am satisfied. I darted towards the spot from which the sound proceeded, but the devil eluded my grasp. However, the moon then shone so that I might see him, and I pursued the monster. And for many months this has been my task. Guided by a slight clue, I followed the windings of the Rhone to the blue Mediterranean, and by a chance saw the fiend board a boat for the Black Sea. I followed. Amidst the wilds of Tartary and Russia, although he still evaded me, I have followed forever in his track. My life, as it passed thus, was indeed hateful to me, and it was during sleep alone that I could taste joy. As I still pursued my journey to the northward, the snows thickened and the cold increased. By now I had procured a sledge and dogs, and when I first saw the great northern ocean, the fiend was but one day distant from me, and I was sure must have been halted. But a lonely cottager assured me that the monster had travelled on across the mountainous ices of the ocean, and so I exchanged my land sledge for one fashioned for the inequalities of the frozen ocean, and purchasing a plentiful supply of provision, I departed from land. I cannot guess how many days have passed since then, but I have endured misery which nothing but the eternal sentiment of a just retribution burning within my heart could have enabled me to support. I viewed the expanse before me with anguish, when suddenly my eye caught a dark speck upon the dusky plain. I uttered a wild cry of ecstasy when I distinguished a sledge and the distorted proportions of a well-known form. After a necessary rest for my dogs, I pursued this form tirelessly, and after nearly two days' journey I beheld my enemy at no more than a mile distant. But now— when I appeared almost within grasp of my foe, my hopes were suddenly extinguished. A ground sea was heard, the wind rose, and with a great noise the ice cracked, and in a few minutes I was left drifting on a scattered piece that was continually lessening, and thus preparing me for a hideous death. When I saw your ship, after many appalling hours, I broke my sledge to make oars and rowed my ice raft towards you. If you had been going southwards, I had determined still to trust to the mercy of the seas rather than abandon my purpose. You took me on board when my vigour was exhausted, and I should soon have sunk under my multiple hardships into a death which I still dread, for my task is unfulfilled. Or must I die and he yet live? If I do, swear to me, Walton, that he shall not escape. I am not so selfish as to dare to ask you to undertake my pilgrimage, but if he should appear, swear that he shall not live. He is eloquent and persuasive, but trust him not and thrust your sword into his heart. I will hover near and direct the steel aright. <laughs> Robert Walton, in continuation. August 26th. You have read this strange and terrific story, Margaret. And do you not feel your blood congeal with horror? His tale is connected and told with the simplest truth. 
Yet I own that it is more the letters of Felix and Safi he has shown me, and the appearance of the monster near our ship that has brought me to a conviction that this monster has real existence. Frankenstein discovered I was making notes, and himself corrected and augmented them. But on the particulars of the creature's formation he was impenetrable, and therefore I can tell nothing. Thus has a week passed away while I have listened to this narrative. What a glorious creature he must have been in the days of his prosperity. When younger, said he, I imagined myself destined for some great enterprise. My feelings are profound, but I possessed a coolness of judgment. From my infancy I was imbued with high hopes. But how am I sunk? I have longed for a friend. I have sought one who would sympathize, and on these desert seas I have found one. But I fear I have gained him only to lose him. I thank you, Walton he said. But when you talk of new ties, think you that they can replace those who are gone? Wherever I am, the soothing voice of Elizabeth and the conversation of Clerval are whispered in my ear. They are dead, and so I must pursue and destroy the being whom I gave existence. Then my lot on earth will be fulfilled, and I may die. September 2nd. My beloved sister, I write to you, encompassed by peril, and ignorant whether I am ever doomed to see again dear England. I am surrounded by mountains of ice which admit no escape. If we are lost, my mad schemes are the cause. My unfortunate guest regards me with the tenderest compassion. Even the sailors feel the power of his eloquence, but each day of expectation fills them with fear and I almost dread a mutiny. September 5th A scene has just passed, of such uncommon interest, that although it is highly probable that these papers may never reach you, yet I cannot forbear recording it. The cold is excessive, and many of my unfortunate comrades have already found a grave amidst this scene of desolation. Frankenstein has daily declined in health. This morning I was roused by half a dozen sailors. They entered my cabin and insisted that I should engage with a solemn promise that if the vessel should be freed, I would instantly direct my course southwards. This speech troubled me. I hesitated before I answered, when Frankenstein, who had at first been silent, flushed with momentary vigour and turned towards the men. What do you mean? What do you demand of your captain? Are you then so easily turned from your design? Did you not call this a glorious expedition? And now, behold, with the first imagination of danger, you shrink away. Be steady to your purposes. Return as heroes who have fought and conquered, and know what it is not to turn their back on the foe. The men looked at one another after this speech, and were unable to reply. So moved were they. I told them to retire and consider what had been said, and that I would not lead them further north if they strenuously desired the contrary. I know not how this will terminate, but I would rather die than return shamelessly. September 7th. The die is cast. I have consented to return if we are destroyed. My hopes are blasted by cowardice and indecision. September 12th. It is past. I am returning to England. I have lost my hopes of utility and glory. I have lost my friend. I will endeavour to detail these bitter circumstances to you. September 9th. The ice began to move, and roarings like thunder were heard at a distance as the islands split and cracked in every direction. A breeze sprang from the west, and on the eleventh the passage to the south became free. When the sailors saw this, a shout of tumultuous joy broke from them. Frankenstein, who was dozing, awoke and asked the cause of the tumult. They shout, I said, because they will soon return to England. Do you then really return? Alas, yes. I cannot lead them unwillingly to danger and I must return. 
Do so if you will. But I will not. You may give up your purpose, but mine is assigned to me by heaven. And saying this, he endeavoured to spring from the bed, but the exertion was too great for him. He fell back and fainted. It was long before he was restored, and at length he opened his eyes, but was unable to speak. The surgeon gave him a draught, and told me that my friend had not many hours to live. I sat by his bed, and I thought he slept. But presently he called me in a feeble voice. Alas, he said, the strength I relied on is gone. Think not in the last minutes of my existence I feel that burning hatred and ardent desire of revenge I once expressed, but I feel myself justified in desiring the death of my adversary. During these last days I have been occupied in examining my past conduct, nor do I find it blamable. In a fit of enthusiastic madness I created a rational creature, and was bound towards him to assure, as far as was in my power, his happiness and well-being. That was my duty, but there was another still paramount to that, my duty towards the beings of my own species. Urged by this view, I did right in refusing to create a companion, miserable himself, that he may render no other wretched, he ought to die. I have failed. Now, induced by reason and virtue, rather than selfish and vicious motives, I renew my request for you to undertake my unfinished work. Farewell, Walton. Seek happiness in tranquillity, and avoid ambition. Yet, why do I say this? I have myself been blasted in these hopes. Yet another may succeed. His voice became fainter, and at length he was silent. About half an hour afterwards he pressed my hand, and was gone. Margaret, what comment can I make? My tears flow, my mind is overshadowed. I am interrupted. What do these sounds portend? Again there is the sound of a human voice, but hoarser. They come from the cabin where Frankenstein's remains lie. I must examine. Good night, my sister. Great God, what a scene has just taken place. I hardly know whether I should have the power to detail it. I enter the cabin, and over the remains of my ill-fated friend hung a form which I cannot find words to describe. Gigantic in stature, yet uncouth and distorted in feature. When he heard the sound of me approach, he ceased to utter exclamations of grief and horror and sprung towards the window. I called on him to stay. He paused and looked on me, and I saw that every feature seemed attacked by some uncontrollable passion. That is also my victim, he exclaimed. In his murder my crimes are consummated. Oh, Frankenstein, generous and self-devoted being, what does it avail that now I ask thee to pardon me? Your repentance, I said, is superfluous. If you had listened to the voice of conscience before, Frankenstein would yet have lived. Do you think, replied the demon, that I was then dead to agony and remorse? My heart was fashioned to be susceptible of love and sympathy, and when wrenched by misery to vice and hatred, it did not endure the violence of the change without torture such as you cannot imagine. After the murder of Clerval, I abhorred myself, but when I discovered that the author of my existence dared to hope for a happiness from which I was forever barred, I was filled with a thirst for vengeance. But I was the slave, not the master of an impulse which I could not disobey. I stood at first touched by these expressions of misery. Then I recalled what Frankenstein had said and replied, Wretch, 
It is well that you came here to whine over the desolation you have made. It is not pity that you feel. You lament only because the victim of your malignity is withdrawn from your power. Oh, it is not thus, not thus, interrupted the being. Yet I seek not a fellow feeling in my misery. Once I falsely hoped to meet with beings who would love me for the excellent qualities which I was capable of unfolding. But now... Crime has degraded me beneath the meanest animal, yet it is even so. The fallen angel becomes a malignant devil. You call Frankenstein your friend, seem to have knowledge of my crimes, but he could not sum up the hours and months of misery I endured. Was there no injustice in this? Why do you not hate Felix, who drove his friend from his door? Nay, he is a virtuous being. I am an abortion to be spurned, kicked at, spat on. But it is true that I am a wretch. You hate me, but the abhorrence cannot equal that with which I regard myself. Fear not that I shall be the instrument of future mischief. Neither yours nor any man's death is needed to consummate the series of my being and accomplish that which must be done, but it requires my own. I shall quit your vessel on my ice raft. I shall collect my funeral pile and consume to ashes this miserable frame. Where can I find rest but in death? Farewell. I leave you. Farewell, Frankenstein. Blasted as thou wert, my agony was still superior to thine, for the bitter sting of remorse will not cease to rankle in my wounds until death shall close them forever. But soon, he cried, soon these burning miseries will be extinct. My ashes will be swept into the sea by the winds. My spirit will sleep in peace. Farewell. And he sprang from the cabin window as he said this, upon the ice raft which lay close to the vessel. He was soon borne away by the waves and lost in the darkness and distance.